Creamers, I have with me here two-time Emmy Award winner, Vincent DePaul, an actor and a producer from Baltimore. He's acted in Hairspray, Hitch, Poseidon, Beckman, and most recently, Beverly Hills Christmas 2. And Love on the Rock, shot on location in Malta. He has produced an Amazon Prime Emmy Award winning show, The Bay Series, and The Welder. He is a known devoted philanthropist, volunteering at a center for battered women, and a supporter of the Special Olympics. Vincent, how are you doing today? I am amazing, and thank you so much for uh, having me. I'm happy to be here in Hollywood. <laughs> so this, it's a great energy to be here. I'm very excited to have this chat with you. I want to start off where you start off. Started off. Tell us about your dad's job. Oh my gosh! Well, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and my family owned funeral homes. And so my dad was a mortuary scientist. He basically was the one who had all of these different services where he helped loved ones during the most difficult times of their life. And so he was the funeral director to the folks all around the world. They would contact my dad to have their loved ones taken care of and they would be then ultimately shipped to different places around the world, to Italy, to Spain, Yugoslavia. So they would come to my father and then their loved ones would then be taken care of and then shipped away to their country. Did your dad being a mortuary scientist affect your decisions when you were a child? Absolutely. So growing up in Maryland, my mother and father always wanted me to do something that dealt with working in the funeral home and helping with them. And so I went to school at Johns Hopkins where I studied epidemiology and biomedical ethics and biostatistics. And I was like, mm, the funeral home business is a little bit too dead for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so <laughs> I said, okay, I, so I graduated, but I really didn't want to do that. So I just kind of segued into other things where I studied drama and movement and all of that, because that's really, I thought was my uh, vocation. So that was it. Amazing. What do you miss most about Baltimore living? In Los Angeles. Wow. Um, so Baltimore. I miss going to like the Ravens games and our former football team called the Colts. Now, you know, the Ravens and the Orioles games. I miss that camaraderie. Baltimore is a very provincial town. I mean, it's the home of John Waters, who directed Hairspray, Cry Baby, Cecil B. Demented, Polyester, all these wonderful indie films. And also the home of Barry Levinson, Academy Award winner, director of Rain Man and mm -hmm. Toys and... Avalon and Liberty Heights. And so I miss that kind of small town energy. It's great to be here in LA, but going back to Baltimore, it was just such a great vibe and feeling because it was so friendly. You know, you knew the community, you knew the people. Amazing. Yeah. Is your aunt uh, Sorrento Milestone's delicatessen still in business? Ah, oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, so my... My family's business in Baltimore, Maryland, on Harford Road was Sorrento's Mastelonis. And so my aunt and uncle, Andrea and Ro Margaret Rose Mastelloni, had a delicatessen on Harford Road. And they still are in business. And they're continued by the Di Pasquale family, which was featured by a lot of the home cooking shows. I forgot whatever the shows were. It's with that... Guy Fieri? Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, Guy Fieri came to that delicatessen, Di Pasquale's, and they're continuing with that. Wow, that's a that's a major part of <laughs> trivia in my life. That's hilarious. That's so funny. Did your family owning a funeral home make you think any interesting ways about death early on in life? Yes. Yeah, so it's very, very kind of compelling. So I was doing a TV series called Sex in the City with Sarah Jessica Parker and Cynthia Nixon and the group. and I've heard of it. <laughs> HBO series. And they said to me, Vince, you're doing great. Would you um, talk to one of the producers for a second? I'm like, sure. They said, um, they're starting to do a show called um, Mort Morticians in Love, which ultimately would be called um, Six Feet Under. Would you um, be interested in going out to LA to talk to them about this show? I'm like, sure. My, pl my pleasure. So I went out to L.A. and I advised on Six Feet Under for the Fisher Funeral Home. And mm -hmm. so ultimately, 
my agent negotiated me to be in a role in uh, Six Feet Under, and so I was really happy. The one episode, I snorted the ashes of my best friend's dead body in the episode, and that was a fun episode at the Fisher Funeral Home, and so I did Six Feet Under, and so, yeah, like, at the onset of it is, like, I was acting, but I had all these uh, real life skills that really worked in Hollywood. I guess that you've done a lot of research on me. I, I didn't know there was so much out there on me. Wow. Okay. So you seem like such a lively and warm guy. Right. Did things like being driven to the hairspray set and your family's funeral hearse ever contrast with this demeanor? Oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> in 1987, I did the movie Hairspray with Divine, Ricky Lake, uh, Sonny Bono, uh, Blondie, Debbie Harry, of course. And uh, so I did not understand what filmmaking was about. I was a teenager in Baltimore. I was cast in this movie. So some of the days I did not show up and they called to my parents and said, hey, we need your son to come to set because for continuity. And I'm like, oh, I thought I already finished that. I thought this was a TV show. And they're like, no, it's a movie. So I remember early on I was sent to set with one of my father's drivers in a hearse, a 1962 Cadillac. Um, and I arrive on to set at the Palladium in Baltimore, Maryland, and John Waters comes out and he's like, uh, we didn't order a hearse uh, for this movie, although it was 1962 Baltimore and the hearse was a 1962 uh, Cadillac hearse. And it was very funny because he thought it was the, the most hilarious thing that I showed up in a hearse. So I came out of the hearse and I finished doing my scenes in Hairspray. So if you look at the movie Hairspray, you see me in the first act and the second act. And then the third act, they had someone that was basically a body double of me with dark hair. And they shot him mostly from the back. And then at the end of the movie, you see me at the uh, 1962 auto show at the Palladium. And yeah, it's very interesting. I didn't know what it was to be an actor in films because I was so young and I didn't really get it. But John Waters was the first person who ever gave me an opportunity and I was honored to work with people like Ricky Lake and Divine and Sonny Bono and uh, Blondie. It's amazing. <laughs> I know. Why were you interested in studying etymology, biomedical ethics and biostatistics at John Hopkins University? Well, when I went to Hopkins, I was really trying to do something that I thought would, you know, facilitate a career in either NIH, National Institute of Health, which was nearby in Washington, D.C., or something that I could do to help with my family business. And so I thought epidemiology would be great because it was the study of pandemics, endemics, and epidemics. And in interestingly <laughs> enough, my professor told us back then that your class will encounter an epidemic in your lifetime. Yeah. And here we are in COVID. And for them to know then in the 90s mm -hmm. that we would experience an epidemic in 2020 through 2021 is remarkable because I'm like, how do they know that we would have, you know, Corona and COVID in the 90s? But they did. At Johns Hopkins, they already knew that there would be widespread um, epidemics that will affect the world. What kind of a, a career were you intending? Well, ultimately, I was just going to try to um, work and be with my family's business. But then when I moved to Miami Beach, um, I worked at Mount Sinai Medical Center. I'm like, okay, this is a good way to, to work. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was jogging on the beach in my Speedo and then <laughs> A guy came up to me and he says, ah, I think you modelo. I'm like, okay. And it was Johnny Versace. Yeah. So I left working at Mount Sinai to model for the late Johnny Versace. And I went and to Milan. I modeled at Bell Harbor Shops. And so I didn't know that that was my trajectory, but I was happy that it was. My next question is, why did you choose acting over that? I feel that acting was something that really was you know, my energy, the thing that I thought would be best to express myself. And a lot of times people, we do a lot of different things and we do, we're like, is this what we should do? Or is this what we should do? And I knew that um, acting was the way that I could really maybe tell stories and show epiphanies and show journeys. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I chose acting. 
you know, because I wanted to be a storyteller and I thought this was the best way to, to tell stories. I mean, I, I'm, I can write, but I'm not a great writer, but I feel by acting, you can tell stories by your energy and by your emotion and by your struggles, by your joys. So amazing. What was it that first interested you in taking theater classes with Jennifer Warren while at college? Oh, wow. Okay. Jennifer Warren, amazing actress who was my teacher at Johns Hopkins at the Ariana Theater. She was so empowering to all of her, all the students. I remember she made us write the actual dialogue for our characters and for other characters, and she would not let us act. Uh, the the stuff we wrote, she would have us write it and have other people act mm -hmm. it out. So I wrote one about, it was called The Pageant. Jennifer Warren loved it. It was about a female who was entering into a pageant and how she went through all these different changes and how all the people were so fake, her, her contestants. And she loved it. I remember that she was like, I, this is the best writing I've ever seen. And so Jennifer Warren was a great teacher for all the students at Johns Hopkins because the trek was for them to go into medicine and to mm -hmm. go into science. But the people that really wanted to do the other part, which was uh, theater writing and drama and stuff like that, she really gave us an outlet to do it. And uh, I really like her. Is she still alive? I think she is. I'm not sure, but we can fact. Yeah, let's, we, we have to Google. Jennifer Warren, is she alive? <laughs> I think Jennifer Warren is still alive. She was great. Would you ever go back to your medical career? You know what? Surprisingly enough, now that we're in the time of COVID, while I've been back in Miami Beach, Florida, I've been doing a lot of outreach. You know, so I, I went back to Mount Sinai. I got vaccinated with the Moderna shots and so forth. And um, I would say that I feel that I would do more work in sciences. I'm still very much, you know, um, happy to do my film and TV work. Of course, Love on the Rock, which I shot in Malta with Academy Award winning nominee uh, Stephen Bauer. Uh, I work with um, Jeff Fahey, uh, Emmy Award winner Kira Reed Lorsch, um, actors um, Lorianne Guilleron, uh, actors. Um, Alex Watson and star David Ayer White. So I would definitely do something in the sciences, but I'm really happy that I get to enjoy performing in film and TV. And I think that is really my calling mm -hmm. to entertain populations. But if I'm asked to serve and help folks, I will do it. <laughs> you know, science is science. You know, it's it's finite. Um, when you can help people in the medical field, I think it's it's very important. Amazing. How did you feel when you first landed your role as Beowulf, and why do you think you were chosen for it? Oh my gosh, it? Beowulf, the oldest Scandinavian novel ever written. Um, <laughs> when I did that Beowulf, I was like, "Whoa, uh, this is interesting." I'm, you know slaying a dragon, Grendel and all that. I thought, wow, um, it was it was a part that I, I thought was so akin to who I was. And there was a lot of kind of like stunts that I had to learn. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was great. It was one of the most amazing thing to do. You were scouted for your role in Hairspray while performing at the Italian Festival <laughs> by Apocla Dance Studio. Do you believe in luck? I, or destiny. I 100%. So when I was dancing for the Italian um, festival in Baltimore, Maryland, and they were like, oh, you know what? You should go and audition for this movie Hairspray. I'm like, okay, sure. And I went in and they showed me these dances, which was the mashed potato, the twist, and all these dances. And I picked them up instantaneously. They're like, okay, can you be on set tomorrow? I'm like, okay, sure. Um, I didn't know exactly what I was getting into, but... As a teenager, I'm like, okay, we'll do it. And um, I guess in some way it's destiny. And sometimes you have to trust that other people know what's best for you. Because sometimes you may not always know what's mm. best for yourself. But sometimes people see within you greatness. Mm. And that when they see greatness within you, you have to say, okay, well, if this is what I should be doing, then I should do it. Do you believe in manifestation? And if so, how do you practice it? 
Um, yes, I believe in manifestation. I always try to manifest good intentions and I always try to put forward a good energy towards others. I'm on the mindset of like, we should empower everyone. There are emerging filmmakers, emerging directors, emer emerging actors, and we should try to empower them and try to give them an opportunity to shine because heck, we can do whatever we want, but if we help someone else, they're the next generation. They're the generation that will then be able to continue and um, carry on with a legacy. Yeah. Tell us your craziest, funniest memory of studying with Sally Kirkland. <laughs> okay, many, many, many years with Sally Kirkland. Okay, Golden Globe winning actress for Best Actress in the feature film Anna with Paulina Portsakova. Um, that year she uh, was up against Meryl Streep and Cher for Moonstruck. And she won the Golden Globe, which tomorrow is the Golden Globe Awards at the Beverly Hills Hilton Hotel, uh, hosted by Amy Poehler. Uh, Sally Kirkland, <laughs> to me, is one of those actresses that have transcended generations of generations of generations. Her um, PA, her production assistant, was the star of... Uh, Gosh, he did the, the movie. Um, gosh, I, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, he did Kevin Costner. That's it, Kevin Costner. So she told me so many stories because Kevin Costner was her PA early on, and Kevin Costner later casted her in a few movies. Um, and so she always told me, she said to me, you have something within you and you always need to produce yourself. Mm -hmm. No one will produce you like you produce yourself. And she believed uh, because her great mentor and teacher at Lee Strasberg was uh, Shelley Winters, mm -hmm. Shirley Shrevis, Academy Award winner for The Diary of Anne Frank. Uh, Sh Shirley Shrevis, Shelley Winters believed in producing what you can do best. And so I did maybe five films with uh, a, a Golden Globe winning actress, Sally Kirkland. But there are so many funny stories of just like, the, the great times that she had with um, Nick Nolte and, and, his, and his Malibu home where she used to do Shakespeare and Malibu, where we would be outside Nick Nolte's um, home and we would be doing Shakespeare in the grass. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and so we would be doing all these different roles, Bassano, uh, the Merchant of Venice and all these things. But she was always someone that, that really believed in me and she said, you should sing more, you should do this more. And I never knew how much those important things were. And now I look back at the times that I had with her and I'm like, gosh, I was so fortunate to have worked with someone who had been with so many great stars. I mean, she, she was with Andy Warhol. She was one of the most beautiful 30 women of Andy Warhol. She, uh, she was co-star with Robert De Niro. She co-star with Dustin Hoffman. She co-star with Robert Redford. She like all of her list of all the co-stars through her life, and she was always someone that empowered me as an actor. And I'm I'm very fortunate. I also did her talk show because she used to do a West Hollywood talk show that would air every Sunday in West Hollywood, and uh, she was always one that believed in uh, making sure that you as an actor have comfortable in your own skin and, and wanted you to perform the best you possibly could. Amazing. Yeah. Do you remember the defining moment when you went from acting to behaving as you put it in front of camera? Right. So what I think, I hope is true is that really people don't want to see actors act. They want to see people behave. They want to see people organically existing in a way where they live moment to moment, beat to beat, that all of a sudden they get to all of a sudden peer into your life as as you're existing your celebrations your struggles your joys your sadness and so that is why i think that acting is not acting at all it's just existing and behaving and that's why i believe in that i feel the greatest actors like of course james dean like mm -hmm. marlon brando they behaved they existed, and that's what people felt uh, in, very interesting to watch. 
acting seems for you to be a skill you are continuously developing and enriching. What is a recent thing you've learned about acting? Uh, okay, recently I was very happy to work on a movie called The Welder, uh, directed by David Liz. Um, and so in that movie, I play a doctor, a modern day Frankenstein, who welds body parts onto people. And I didn't realize that this script would be so um, important to our life because all of a sudden he's welding cultures, black, white, Latino, onto one person. And uh, I didn't know that this would be so, right now, such a prevalent thing that we need to be respectful of all people, mm -hmm. all cultures, everyone. <laughs> so The Welder by David Liz, pretty remarkable movie. What was or is your least favorite and or the most difficult role or archetype for you to play? Well, um, okay, so the, the most difficult archetype would be someone that doesn't respect other people or other cultures. Recently I had to play a very racist um, individual in a film and so as a result, that really doesn't come naturally to me because I'm always accepting of others. But as an actor, as a performer, you need to all of a sudden forget about all that and you just need to live in the moment and be become that person. And I really didn't like necessarily doing that, but that's what the role required. What are some of the shadow aspects of the Hollywood cinema and how did you resist succumbing to them? Right. The way I detox from Hollywood is I go to Miami Beach and um, I lay out on the beach and chill. <laughs> and, and like all of a sudden you leave Hollywood land and you go back to South Florida and you're all of a sudden like, oh, this is really wonderful. Because sometimes if you're always here, you kind of cannot see beyond Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood is wonderful and it's great. But also you need to exist in other places like my hometown in Baltimore, Maryland, or if you're from Wisconsin or from Chicago or from Texas, you need to go back because then you all of a sudden have a reality check. And I think that's important. I don't think that I've succumbed to the Hollywood energy. Mm -hmm. I, I'm here, I work here, but I'm not a product of Hollywood. I love that. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So here's a little question to go back and figure out a little bit more about okay. your style. So we know that your favorite style of films are from the 20s and the 30s. Yes. And that you think that you were probably born slightly too late. Yes, absolutely. Do you see the current productions at all starting to resemble those, those decades in certain ways? Yeah, I, I feel that those movies that were produced then, I think that they had such a great story and a, a, such a great journey. Recently, I got to do a movie called God's Not Dead 4, we the People, starring Isaiah Washington, Antonio Sabato, David A. R. White. That is an homage to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is the Frank Capra movie starring Jimmy Stewart. And I love that that genre where it's it's a great story and a great um, energy behind it. I feel like I was not supposed to be born now. I feel that my energy is more of that period. I would love to do everything in black and white. I mean, I love these Sony cameras, but it would be great if they were <laughs> these old pano, you know, uh, cinemascope cameras and we shoot something in black and white. Sinking through the floor. So Sinking happy. through the floor, right. <laughs> and um, I was happy to work on the Academy Award winning film, The Artist, mm -hmm. that won the Oscar with uh, Jean D. Jordan. And I love that because it was a story about Douglas Fairbanks. I love that. Um, so yeah, so I feel like if I was to do another film, I would like to do it that is of that period, you know, something period, 20s, 30s, 40s. Amazing. Was production always your end goal or did you just fall into it? At the onset of it, I was just working in film and TV as an actor, but then I was then asked to work as a producer and I was like, sure. I. I'm happy because as an as an actor, you understand how a day needs to be shot out. You have a 10 hour day, a 15 hour day. We need this many shots to be done. We need to do this much coverage. And so I think it's a natural progression for an actor to know how to produce. And so, yeah, it was good. What were the difficulties in segueing from acting to producing that you encountered at first? 
Um, at the onset of it is like multitasking. It's like, okay, I need to focus as an, the actor and do the performance. And then I also have to make sure that we have a call sheet. I also have to make sure that we have all the crew hired. I need to make sure that all the actors show up. I need to make sure that the lighting is done. So it was like trying to figure out how to do all those things efficiently. Then you figure out how to hire assistants. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you hire assistants and like, okay, that makes life so much easier because you all of a sudden internalize it and say, I need to make sure all this gets done. But you don't. You can hire people to do it for you. And I think that's a great thing. And so I, I'm very happy that I'm an Emmy Award winning producer because I knew how to delegate. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, you, you, you have to. If you're, if, a film is like a business and yeah. you just have to learn how to do that. And and at, at the onset of it, I'm like, no, I need to make all the calls and take care of everything. But no, you can you can have someone delegate. So, Who was the most pleasant star that you had the pleasure of working with? Uh, the list goes on. From Drew Barrymore from writing Cars of Boys, directed by Penny Marshall, where Penny Marshall took me to the side and said, Drew is not crying in the scene. I need you to make her cry. While she's eating potatoes, she was watching the um, basketball game on her monitor. That's a very funny story. Penny Marshall loved watching basketball. And so while we were shooting in New York City, she would be watching basketball and also directing us in Riding Cars with Boys with Brittany Murphy. And she wasn't getting the performance out of Drew. And she's like, you know, I gotta make her cry. I'm like, Oh God. So I walked over to Drew and I started to say like really mean things to her and she's like, oh my God, why are you saying that? And then I got her to cry. And so I love working with Drew Barrymore and she's dynamic and um, uh, just many people. I mean, I got to work with so many people throughout my career and I'm so blessed that I got to work with them. So amazing. We just have a few more. Okay. Almost here at the end. Okay. The home stretch. What would be your dream genre? style of film to produce? Dream genre of style of film that I would like to produce would be a silent film noir film. I would love that. Amazing. What is some advice you would give a newcomer to Hollywood today? A newcomer for Hollywood today is surround yourself by like-minded people. Mm -hmm. It's really important that you, you're with people that are great artisans, great cinematographers, great actors, great um, storytellers because basically you're empowering them and they're empowering a new generation. And um, that's one thing that I highly recommend. <laughs> Amazing. Why do you volunteer at the House of Camillus for Battered Women? For me, working at the House of Camillus in South Florida is very important. We need, of course, to always understand that everyone goes through different journeys. And so um, when I served uh, at the House of Camillus Thanksgiving dinner, it all of a sudden changed me as a person because I was able to help others and to feed these ladies who in some way were battered, domestic abuse or whatever. And um, I realized how blessed I am and that I need to be more aware of others and to be more uh, caring and more accepting of others. What are some other causes that you are passionate about and want to help in moving forward? Um, well, the other causes that I think are important right now is um, empowering all cultures. So no matter what kind of diversity that we have, it's important that we understand others, um, that we should realize that we have a lot of entitlement that is going on and that we need to kind of very much focus on understanding our brothers and sisters and making them feel just as equal as we are. And yeah. you know, I think that's a great thing is that we're all in it together. We're all one people. Tell us about some projects that you're currently working on. Oh my gosh. Okay, so <laughs> I have so many things and you can run trailers. So um, there's so many trailers. Um, so <laughs> the feature film, The Welder, directed by David Liz, you can run the trailer of that. It's a modern day Frankenstein movie. It's a thriller. Um, the movie Beckman, um, which is with David R. White, uh, and starring amazing cast, including uh, William Baldwin, Kara Reed Lourish, and myself, Beckman, a uh, film called Secret Society, directed by Jamal Hull, written by Miasha Coleman. 
And then, of course, Love on the Rock, directed by Matt Shapira, and that stars um, Academy nominee Stephen Bauer of Scarface, Jeff Fahey, uh, Lorian Guilleron, and wow, there's a lot of films. And then, of course, Tesla, the movie I did with Ethan Hawke that won at Sundance 2020 for the Alfred P. Sloan Award about Nikola Tesla, who created Concurrent Energy. I played George Westinghouse's protege, uh, co-starring with uh, Jim Gaffigan and um, McCla- um, Colin McLaughlin <laughs> from Twin Peaks. So all those films people can enjoy. Oh, and one more, Ryan Philippe. I did a movie called The Second, directed by Brian Skiba. And so all those films you can watch, and I'm really happy to be part of those. Amazing. What's your favorite word? My favorite word is endure. (laughs) What's your least favorite word? Um, Struggle. What's your favorite trend? Lip syncing. <laughs> I love watching lip syncing. I think it's hilarious. Do you ever watch lip syncing? I love yeah, yeah. it. That's I don't know if it's a trend, but T- TikTok I, is a huge trend. That's yeah. that, but I see people lip syncing and I love that. What's your least favorite trend? Least favorite trend is like people putting down people. I don't like that at all. I think that we should always encourage people. That's it. What turns you on? Um sunshine. What turns you off? Um no uh, dessert after dinner. <laughs> what comes to mind when you hear the phrase cream on top? Cream on top. Um, it, it's cream on top. A lot of things. It reminds me of uh, Hagen Dazs ice cream with cream on top. The best of the best. Um, it reminds me of something that's really joyous. You can sink your teeth into and enjoy and and like for a long time and savor it um it reminds me of dessert (laughs) that's the truth i mean yeah thank you so much um it was a pleasure here talking with you thank you for your wonderful answers and gracing us with your presence um let let uh let the creamers know where that they can find you sure um first of all i love (laughs) <laughs> Cream on top, established in 2020. <laughs> Nutritional facts, music you love, 300%. Good vibes, 200%. Last 100%. Sunsets, 250. Oh my gosh, I love sunsets. Yeah. Nostalgia, 100%. I love nostalgia. Um, you'll you'll love uh, God's Not Dead for We the People, which is the remake of the Frank Hepper, an homage to the Frank Hepper movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Very nostalgic. Jimmy Stewart. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Vince Nepal 12, and on Twitter, Vince Nepal 21, on IMDb, Vincent D E space P A U L, and you can see my filmography. And um, everyone, creamers, cream on top rocks. I'm happy to be here in Hollywood, uh-huh. where dreams are made every day, and wishing everyone the very best. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Sure.